Welcome to the Total Connector Show. My name is Kevin Navani. My very special guest today is Giacomo Zucco. Uh, for the second time live, um, uh, well, for the first time I, I had you in Riga. Uh, thank you so much for coming, uh, Giacomo. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. All right, Giacomo. Um, first of all, uh, I'm a great fan of yours because uh, I don't know where you channel all this uh, knowledge and <laughs> wisdom. But um, uh, let me let me start off uh, with that um, with that series of articles uh, because I had to read them like uh, at least three, uh, triple times. Um, uh, the the discovering discovering Bitcoin, right? And let me. Get this. So first of all, I scammed you because uh, I, in the introduction, I clarified that uh, these articles were only taking uh, five minutes a day of your time. But if you read it uh, three times, that, that's 15 minutes per day. So sorry for the scam. <laughs> okay. um, you see, um, what I really love about these articles because it breaks down the things, especially the, the, uh, even the basic misconceptions that people might have. Uh, about you know the totality of Bitcoin, and you've really broken it down even linguistically. You know you're breaking the, you uh, you you used even some terms that uh, you know for the sake of sort of as a trade-off uh, instead of using you know a complex terminology. So you broke it down. Why didn't you? Um, uh, I'm gonna you know put this put these links anyway in the show notes, and people should definitely I should I, I can only recommend people you know to my listeners and viewers to to watch uh, to to read uh, these article or the the these seven episodes of your article discovering Bitcoin. But could you guys, like go through like each one of them, maybe not necessarily in chronological order, but what would what is what was the main intention purpose or and 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 background of why why did you write those articles? What did you want to convey? What did you want to communicate? Uh, what was the basis of this of this article? So maybe I will start with the background because it's uh, even if it's historical, it's a little bit personal, but I think it's very uh, it can be clarifying. Uh, it can help clarifying uh, the the choices I, I made. Basically, when I started to do uh, education and consultancy about Bitcoin and blockchain, it was uh, late two thousand thirteen. And I had a lot of clients, uh, especially institutional clients like Italian banks, uh, coming uh, for my uh, from uh, coming to my company to ask for blockchain education. And I noticed that there was a lot of misunderstanding about the term blockchain. Of course, it was a hype, but it was really not clear what blockchain did mean. And blockchain was interpreted as like a magical kind of uh, fairy dust that you can put on everything, uh, making it more. Uh, decentralized or efficient or uh, private or anything while uh, some of these uh, some of these claims were exaggerated and some of these claims were actually uh, straight at false like a, a blockchain system is not more scalable than a centralized system is less scalable is not more private is centralized parable is less, less private but what it does is just one thing allowing you to keep chronology uh, in a completely decentralized way so what I started to do was actually um, is insulating blockchain from the overall discussion. So I started from the episode seven of my series. So I eliminated, I, I singled out the blockchain buzzword and I tried to explain that uh, the only reason you do have a blockchain is because you need uh, to maintain a chronology, a, a, relative, uh, a relative unique chronology uh, in your system. And you need to keep a chronology only because uh, you are moving money, because uh, any kind of message can be sent twice. And if the contest is, is OK, it's OK. But only when you have value, you cannot uh, spend the same value twice. If you have, I mean, if I have an information, a valuable information, I can give it to you and it's valuable. Then I give it to somebody else and it's still valuable. So my messages can be duplicated and that's not a problem. But if I give you some, property right, I cannot give the same property right to somebody else after. So that's the only reason we need a chronology to keep uh, like, a, 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 to prevent double spending. So it's a purely chronological problem. So I started to go about this when topic, which is the final part of my, of my discussion to, uh, to single out blockchain. Actually, uh, I use the time chain um, word in the article, which is also what Satoshi used in the comments of the code and in the first uh, uh, post about the structure, he didn't call it blockchain. He did call it time chain. 
which I think is very telling about the, the use of this, uh, of this data structure. And then from there, I move to what are you actually uh, trying to, uh, to, uh, to put in your unique chronology, which is a chain or a, better a tree of digital signatures. So how do you, uh, do you uh, pass your property? First, you have to make sure that uh, the passage is not done twice, so you don't have double spending, and you need a blockchain for that. And then uh, you need the signatures in order to prove that you moved uh, your stuff to, uh, to the other party. So I started to explain uh, private keys and pr public keys and ECDSA scheme and st stuff like that. Then I moved to the, to the issuance problem. So even if, I mean, even eGold, in, uh, in the 1995, they have a cryptographic password scheme system. Even eCash uh, or, or DigiCash in uh, 1990 of David Chow, they had basically a digital check with a, a tree of digital signatures. The problem is that what are you spending? How, how can you, I mean, now we know how to move the asset digitally from one person to the other, but how can we uh, deposit the initial asset in the system, create the original value. And this is the occasion for me to explain proof of work and digital scarcity and, uh, and supply, uh, control and supply schedule and stuff like that. And then uh, at the end, uh, there was the problem that all this function could be, um, could be actually provided um, easily in an easier way by a centralized system. So if you want to prevent double spending, uh, the only thing that you need is a server which just timestamp any transaction and eliminate all transaction in favor of, uh, eliminate new transaction if there is already an old transaction spending the same thing. So if you have a, se a central server, you don't need a blockchain for time. You don't even need signatures for, uh, for, uh, for, uh, um, for uh, people for uh, authorship because you can just use uh, like uh, username and password. Uh, if, you have, uh, if you have a system like PayPal, you don't need uh, the, the, the user to keep uh, a cryptographical private key secured. You just need passwords so they can use uh, their easily mnemonic password, they can change it, they can lose it, they can ask you to get another. It's simpler for the user if you can use a, a password than a private key. Private keys are hard, like if you lose it, you're, 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 uh, you, you cannot recover your funds anymore. If you lose your PayPal password, you can call PayPal to get another one. So it's easier to have a centralized server. And then even if you want to issue a new kind of value, yeah, proof of work can work kind of uh, in order to, to issue this new digital scarcity with uh, uh, automatic adjustment of difficulty and uh, emission issue schedule and all. But why you have to do that if you can use a centralized server controlling a centralized vault with gold and instead of bootstrapping a new financial assets from scratch in 2008, 2009, we actually leverage an asset which already exists since at least 7,000, 10,000 years, and at scale, at least 5,000 or 4,000 years. So just use the asset that people were using for thousands of years instead of bootstrapping a new one. So then it comes the part about decentralization, the where part. So when uh, is solved by a blockchain? Who is solved by digital signatures? What is solved by um, difficulty adjustment of proof of work? And uh, the, the real problem is where? We need a completely decentralized system because if we didn't need that, there were easier way to provide in each one of these services. But the real reason is that uh, for, for all these new technologies is that we need a completely decentralized peer-to-peer -peer system without a single point of failure. And then there is the other, the, the other question uh, even further away, which is why? Why do we need a decentralized system? Centralized systems are more efficient. So why do we need an, you know, an inefficient decentralized system? And the answer is that for that kind of purpose, so being uh, a system managing money, the, uh, the gain to attack the system was so high that any kind of centralized system has been attacked and corrupted or censored over the years uh, in any single situation. And you cannot create a good monetary system without creating a strong incentive for somebody to uh, attack it. And so my, my, the old way I did present my, my, my breakdown of Bitcoin was uh, uh, when blockchain, who signatures, what uh, uh, automatic adjustment of difficulty in proof of work, uh, and where decentralization and why uh, the history of money. Then I realized that uh, people were basically, I was asking people to 
uh, to do a reverse causal chain. Like they, they had to learn blockchain to solve a problem that they didn't understand until I actually get why, which is a very strange way to present it. So during this article, I decided to flip it on the other way around and I said, okay, let's start with why. Let's start with what is our purpose. So let's ignore the blockchain hype. That, you know, there is the, the funny meme of the, the guy with the gold medal. I'm here for the technology. Uh, that's, that's supposed to mock people which are just here for financial gain. But actually, uh, it's, it's more correct to be here for the financial gain, uh, gain than to be here for the technology. In a way, the technology is only a tool for the financial purpose, which is having a good kind of money. So, uh, so I said, let's reverse it. Don't be here for the technology. Try to be here just for money, saving, investing, uh, the kind of, uh, of social uh, technologies that uh, enable civilization and uh, prosperity for, uh, for, for millenniums. So let's start from there. And so I, I took the why part, like why do we need good money uh, and why people uh, is incentivized to attack and corrupt good money. And I expanded these and I noticed that uh, funnily enough, uh, all the parts of the why can be put in the same kind of column of, of the technological tools of Bitcoin. So you can start with the when and to, you can explain investment. So money is mostly about time. And also I want to make clear this, uh, I really wanted to make clear that uh, there is a debate about uh, money as uh, a store of value and money as medium of exchange. Uh, both functions are very, very important, but I think it's not true that the functions are completely symmetrical. I think that uh, medium of exchange uh, uh, implicates, logically implicates store of value and not the other way around. Like a home can be a store of value, you can store value in real estate, but it's a, a terrible medium of exchange because yeah, you do exchange a home, but you never exchange a home as an indirect medium to exchange somebody, something else. It's not that, that I, have a, I have food, you have some, uh, some book, and I will use a home as a medium to, uh, to exchange uh, books with, uh, with food. So uh, uh, real estate is not a medium of exchange, but it is store of value. And the thing is that everything in order to be a store of value must be first medium of exchange. Why? Sorry, uh, uh, the, op the other way around. Uh, everything to be a medium of exchange, it has to be uh, a store of value. Why? Because uh, using medium of exchange means using indirect exchange. So it means that I give you something and you give me not what I wanted, but what I will store for a while, looking for something, someone else to give him in exchange of, for some, someone something I need. So I, I give you fish, I want water. Uh, you give me money, I will have to store this money for a while until I find somebody who will give me water in exchange for this, for this money. So the medium of exchange phase always assume at least a little bit of uh, time, uh, time extension of the, of the storage of wealth. So the first function is the really fundamental one. And uh, there, there are also historical reasons, like the great, uh, um, the great essay by Nick Sabo about the origin of money, uh, uh, like uh, uh, shelling out. Uh, it was a, a, a great description of how, in fact, most of the things that uh, were used as money started out as collectibles. So people were actually collecting rare things that, uh, that uh, are difficult to reproduce and they were collecting them for the future like memorabilia. And then from this function, uh, is, uh, they started to use uh, um, this store of value as a um, medium for indirect exchange. So I get something, I keep it, I don't consume it, I give it away later and I get something else and I consume it. People sometimes is confused about this because they think that a medium of exchange just means that you exchange something. So a house is a medium of exchange because you exchange it. You don't consume it directly. But that's not the point of medium of exchange. Medium of exchange is not anything which is exchanged. It is anything which is exchanged uh, with, uh, with a delayed uh, indirect exchange over time. So uh, I, uh, overall, I started this series of articles from the time problem. So uh, you are alone, you are a caveman, there is nobody around you. You just want to increase your value over time. And so you start to do 
uh, storage of wealth and investment of the wealth that is stored. And that basically creates the first function of money, which is, store, uh, which is store of value. Then, if you want to actually use all the value that you created with investment, uh, because you're, uh, you know, uh, the utility function is, uh, is, uh, is not linear, it's sublinear. You, if you have one fish, you eat it. If you have two fish, you eat two fish. If you have three, you, you don't really feel like eating it. If you have four, you, cannot, you don't know what to do with that. And if you have five or 500 or 5,000 or 5 million fish, you really have a problem of how to store it, but you, do, you cannot eat it in your life. So the, the point of exchanging is that you start meeting other people and you can specialize in, uh, in, in fish and they can specialize in water. So the second chapter, so the first chapter is about time and investment and storage. The second is about exchange and specialization. And the third one is about convergence. So uh, the, the actual function of uh, medium of exchange. Instead of uh, uh, exchanging everybody everything, we exchange everything with something which is the same. So we can optimize, you know, it's, a, it's something that computer scientists will, will call the, a problem of uh, uh, O, o N square instead of uh, O N. Basically, uh, if everybody has to keep track of the price and provide a liquidity bridge from any kind of good to any kind of good, uh, every time you have uh, uh, 10 people, you need to count any single connection between 10 people, like a network. And when you have 20 people, you have uh, a lot of new connection from anybody to everybody. And that's super expensive to manage and that's very inefficient. So if you, if you, if there is like convergence from barter to money, you actually have one single uh, good which is exchanges against any other good. And then the, uh, it comes the where question, which is centralization. At the beginning, centralization was useful because it provided a great uh, scalability, I call it scaleness in the article, to maintain symmetry between uh, hardness, darkness, and scaleness. Uh, there is a good scalability if we don't actually move an actual physical good, but we move a, a, an inform, a, a informational a good a promise basically in information because inform information can be moved across continents in seconds while physical good they are heavy to uh, they are difficult to store and difficult to move so the uh, when is investment uh, who is uh, exchange and specialization what is convergence uh, when where is uh, uh, virtualization and um, and creation of uh, uh, infor, infor, information theoretical money and then you, we have a problem of uh, uh, corruption of the system uh, because the incentives to corrupt the system are, are very strong because this is one of the most important technology in human money is the most important technology in human civilization so there are very high incentives to corrupt it and so we arrive to the problem of decentralization and then we keep the we, we take back the road to the, to, the, to the technology stack of Bitcoin that I explained before. So first we decentralize the issuance with uh, uh, adjustment difficult, uh, difficulty of proof of work. Then we decentralize the ownership with the signatures. Then we decentralize the chronology with the time chain. And the, the, the block, it's called blockchain, it's just the last tiny piece of the puzzle and we don't really, uh, it's not important per se. It's just important as part of everything else. Then I did some other few, uh, like there is the off-chain part. The, I, I did some kind of strange connection to keep symmetry. Uh, you know, I'm, I think I'm like a symmetry fetishist. So uh, I, I really like to create uh, symmetric schemes and, and that's- uh, Can I interrupt you just for a second? Um, sure. Just for my listeners, it, because I see myself as an educator and I dare to always ask the purposefully naive and stupid questions, which I sometimes provoke people with my question, but it's about immutability, right? The time chain or the blockchain, the Bitcoin, uh, you know, a blockchain or Bitcoin time chain, it, the fundamental thing is about immutability. You cannot, it's, it's in a chronological order. It's set in stone. It's like geological layers and it's like, uh, it's never to be changed. It is there. It is the total proven evidence of the proof of the pudding. So for, Correct. for times to, for eternity to come. Yeah, absolutely. That's the point. And it's very important to understand in my opinion that the, the point is not achieved with the technology. 
a blockchain is not technologically or mathematically immutable. A blockchain is only economically immutable. That means that you can mutate it, but it will be expensive. And the more blocks, the more expensive. And so we assume that after a certain point in time, the exponential cost to uh, an opportunity cost to mutate the structure will be so high that all the actors, uh, whatever they think, whatever they want, whoever they, wa they are, they will not, co uh, they will not uh, collude in order to change it. So the, the, the great illusion is that to think that if you just take one thing and you hash it and you connect with another thing, the structure is immutable. It's not because you can go back, you can change something, create another hash and another hash, and you can just rewrite the chain. Uh, a, a, sufficient, a sufficiently powerful miner could, in theory, rewrite all the blockchain, uh, the Bitcoin time chain, from day zero, and your node, the my node, would actually accept that chain uh, if, they, if they did it. The problem is that they can't because the, the economical cost in order to perform so much work will be unfeasible even with all the resources of, 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 the, of the, uh, the current economy. And especially there will be a lot of opportunity cost of uh, not playing fair, uh, gaining money, and instead wasting your money, money on playing unfair. So there is, a, there is a, an economical layer. And on top of that, there is a social layer, of course. So let's assume that there is a, a miner which is so powerful to rewrite all the chain from day one. We can just decide to ignore it and to change our software to go to another, to another layer. So there is a social consensus. But this social consensus is not something that can be abused like, okay, no problem, we can change everything because of social consensus. Because social consensus is something super difficult, fragile, slow, uh, it's super difficult to reach and super difficult to maintain. Uh, otherwise, we will not need a, a time chain. Otherwise, I do a transaction. I go on Twitter. I ask people, people uh, like a Twitter poll, uh, who is okay with this transaction being final? And when everybody votes for that, it's final. As we use social consensus. We cannot do like that. We need proof of work because uh, social consensus is a weapon that we can use only exceptionally uh, in very rare situations. So. If, uh, the, the fundamental thing that gives uh, immutability to, to the Bitcoin time chain is social consensus. But social consensus is uh, created thanks to economic incentives that are basically uh, created by the economic value of Bitcoin. That has a very serious con consequence, which is you cannot create an immutable blockchain without uh, a, a token like Bitcoin with very strong financial uh, uh, features. If you create uh, your private blockchain, your private blockchain is not immutable because there is no and there isn't any economical incentive to keep it immutable and uh, just to clarify this once for all let's just hype, really i mean I, I find it totally uh, unrealistic and uh, my personal opinion uh, which has been talked about you know nation states coming together colluding uh, conspiring let's just say it wasn't uh, even money wouldn't be the issue they had you know they have like trillions or whatever you know they have like all the resources but because of the combination of game theory skin in the game economic pain that they would incur themselves so that's not the point so even if they did if they even if they attempted to wouldn't now that's that's my question about the nodes uh, all these nodes so the nodes need to validate that even if they try to what, what, what does it look like realistically i mean uh, can they do that seriously if they wanted to or are they totally dependent on all those nodes out there who validate all the transactions uh, or am i mixing up something? Uh, there are two layers to this question the first is uh, what <laughs> nodes do with uh, fake or uh, invalid transactions so what about a miner for example trying to create bitcoin out of nothing uh, violating the issue schedule or they try to spend uh, satoshi's bitcoin without the proper keys if they try to do something like uh, which is invalid in that case your node will just refuse to accept the invalid transaction and what, do, uh, what they will need to do is to convince every single uh, actor in the Bitcoin economy to, act, to give the same economic value to a different kind of set of software rules. And that's basically unfeasible. They cannot force me. I mean, they can force me if they put me in jail, but uh, they cannot force an entire economy. You cannot force people to change their economic pre preference at scale. Like even if Soviet Union or, uh, or, uh, or North Korea they want to create a regulated market. 
people always create uh, black markets everywhere in Venezuela. You cannot, you cannot shape the economy at your will. So even if you have the most powerful nation states, they cannot force you, uh, they cannot force everybody to run a Bitcoin node that use different rules than the rules that Bitcoin decided. So you cannot create new money and you cannot steal money. But uh, if you take control of the mining system, you can only do one thing, which is uh, roll back the chain and, uh, and spend again in a different way your own money. So what the government could do could, could be, for example, roll, uh, roll back the chain for many, many, many blocks. And that could basically, uh, first of all, it would be disruptive for our economy because it would be like uh, uh, many people, they think they were paid, but they had to ask again for payment. And then they paid at other people and so on. So it would be disruptive. And also it could be used to, to double spend. So government cannot, so the attacker cannot take your money, but he can spend his own money twice. And the second thing that they can do is like censorship. They can, for example, go back and recreate empty blocks in order to make, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to price out uh, people from the, from the block space. So in a way, they could be, do a lot of damage. In this case, your full node doesn't help automatically. In, in the first case, your full node helps automatically. So your Bitcoin node will not accept uh, fake uh, or invalid Bitcoin transaction, no matter what they do. Uh, you have to update your node manually in order to accept it. In this case, it's different. Like in this case, they have the advantage because your node will accept any kind of, uh, of um, uh, longest, uh, uh, heaviest proof of work chain following valid rules. And if uh, this attacker rolls back the chain and mines another chain with empty blocks, empty blocks are, are a waste of space, but they are not violating any rules. So your node will accept it. So in that case, you have to actively change your node in order to avoid this kind of attack. And it's socially expectable that if this kind of actor tried to break the chain in a meaningful way, then people or even some developer will come up with a modified version of the node that just uh, refused to accept this rollback. And then we can assume socially and economically that most people will run this new kind of node. So it's a, you're right, but it's a little bit different. When, when the attacker is trying to change the rules of Bitcoin, uh, your node is automatically rejecting and you have to manually accept it. But when they try to uh, rewrite the history with valid transaction, then your node is automatically accepting it and you have to manually um, uh, step in in order to refuse it. So it's the, the, the balance of power is a little bit different. I always think practically, um, not the average user, can, he, can av average user really manually you know, change that, the, or, or is that, or are you talking about like a, you know, experienced technical guy who, who, you know, changes whatever the parameters of the full node once these things happen? Uh, I mean, you know, I'm like thinking of the average person out there. Um, can you hear me? We, we don't know, yeah. of course it will not be a manual thing. It will be like a software. Yeah, it's a little bit disturbed, but I still hear you. Do you hear me as well? Can you hear me as well? Yeah, it was a little bit scrambled. So I don't know what's going on. Uh, weird things going on, but anyway. <laughs> uh, now it's good, now I can hear you now. Okay. <laughs> uh, so anyway, um, okay. so, uh, yeah. So um, it would be a software uh, software update thing. So uh, practically there will be, uh, it's, it's difficult to predict and it's, and it's nice that it's difficult to predict because uh, if it was easy to predict, it would be, it would be easy to exploit. It will be a messy social situation and, uh, and the way it will go will be uh, most likely uh, either the Bitcoin developers uh, inserting in, uh, let's assume for example that uh, tomorrow uh, the government take 60% uh, of the issue power, the government of China or whatever, and they roll back the chain of uh, uh, 2,000 blocks. Uh, what happens that uh, uh, realistically, a new uh, Bitcoin uh, version with, uh, uh, with a patch uh, is released and people can just download it and install it. But, uh, that's like a, a, a crisis management situation. 
You still hear me, right? Yeah, that's very strange things are going on. But anyway, your your voice is becoming sometimes scrambled. I don't know why. Uh, it never happened to me. But okay, that's the way it is. Um, I may have like a network problem with uh, I don't know. Uh, maybe it's uh, it's a connection, but I don't think so. Yeah, I can hear you good. Yeah. So yeah. So. Um, yeah, so that was sort of my question. Like, uh, is that is that something practical? Like something that can be done immediately by by every full note owner, or uh, you know? Uh... No, it's uh, it's something slow, painful, uh, difficult to coordinate, and uh, extremely complex. And that's the way it has to be because the uh, otherwise this kind of uh, update feature of Bitcoin could be exploited in order to attack. So. Since we uh, we don't want user to be ready to install a new or new rules, otherwise the same attacker could actually uh, leverage this uh, this uh, mutability to change the rules. So it's okay that we assume that uh, most of the uh, most of the attackers they will not have the money in order to perform such an attack, and the attacker that will have the money will have to lose a lot of money, and even if they do, uh, we can still. Uh, emergency coordinate in a very difficult way to make, uh, but we will have nothing to lose at this point. I mean, if the attack, is, so, so the more evil is your attack, the less a problem becomes for us to coordinate to change Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. So Bitcoin doesn't change. If you try to change it, you fail. But if you try to exploit it to attack it, then at this point we have nothing to lose and we can change it uh, with less and less resistance to change. So uh, it's a very good, uh, I think it's, a, it's not perfect, but it's a very good equilibrium uh, from a game theoretical point of view. People are still studying it, they're still checking on it. Maybe they will, it will uh, become a little less uh, strong in the future with uh, the block subsidy going down if the price doesn't go up. So we're, Bitcoin is not perfect. Uh, one of the things that people really uh, often misunderstand about Bitcoin maximalists is that nobody thinks that Bitcoin is perfect or is like 100% safe. We know there are possible attack scenarios and we know that uh, there are possible failure scenarios. What we say is that everything else is uh, uh, orders of magnitude less safe and order of magnitude more broken. But, uh, but yeah, it's a very good scenario. Uh, basically, the, the, the status quo is uh, nobody can change the rules. And if the rules are used against the system too much, then we can eventually change the rule because we have nothing to lose. All right. Uh, let me let me ask you for some maybe a woo woo question. But uh, you know, I I know you've I've, I've read all of your posts, uh, you know, excellent posts on Twitter about uh, you know I know you have a very logical and and scientific position and uh, you know knowledge of the climate. I know it doesn't have to do with the topic Bitcoin, but uh, the climate hoax, you know, scientific corruption, scientific uh, fraud going on. Uh, and you know the, the 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 evidence is so overwhelming that um, uh, the, this climate change that's been you know propagated is not man made uh, or man induced or man caused. Uh, so, uh, and we know that the sun, uh, amongst uh, the, the one of the primary factors, is the sun. Could uh, now bringing back to, to Bitcoin uh, or um, to to uh, the, the let's say you know um, the the the, the the control, the accessibility to Bitcoin, um, could, uh, you know, we, there's sometimes the talk about EMPs, electromagnetic, whatever, uh, field strength or whatever. Uh, could it theoretically, if if the sun like bursts out or there are solar eruptions, could these electromagnetic or magnetic gravitational field strength, if they are really strong, like, uh, well, we, we'll have much bigger problems on planet, but would that erase? The information. I'm just gonna na you know, naively ask that. Um, um, or is there yes. some kind of te technological or, you know, natural disaster scenario where, where you know, uh, the private key is going to be just wiped out? I mean, <laughs> is that possible? Uh, I so uh, I don't know, but uh, everything is possible in theory. Uh, but uh, as you said, we would have uh, way more serious problems in that kind of scenario. I mean, a scenario in which uh, uh, a scenario of an electromagnetic impulse so strong to fry circuits everywhere would have uh, the apocalyptic consequences on the entire civilization, and probably uh, Bitcoin private key would be 
just one among the, 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 the millions of, of problems. Uh, the, the, the normal, the, 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 the uh, uh, legacy traditional finance sector will collapse anyway, uh, political section will collapse, uh, nuclear power plants, uh, so it will be a mess. I don't think it's possible. I think that many data storage centers, many data storage solutions, already take into account some kind of Faraday cage isolation, isolation for minor disruption. So I think that would, could also counteract major disruption. But you know, there is no, if a, that, that's a very strange kind of question because is, if a comet uh, impacts with, uh, with the planet, uh, probably Bitcoin is not resilient to that. But <laughs> there are some level of, of threat model that you cannot effectively counteract. Uh, well, one of the problems I have, so, I have no problem with uh, theories that uh, that says that uh, um, climate change can be affected by by human activity. That I, that's not necessarily impossible. It's just very very unlikely, considering the the, the, the molecular dynamic. Uh, uh, you know, uh, if you increase the if you double the CEO concentration uh, in a in a um, uh, in a greenhouse, you can only increase uh, about zero four percent zero five percent. Of the temperature is not linear. Uh, there is a, there is a minority of CO2 in the in the atmosphere. So the, the the theory is a little bit weak, but nothing is impossible. What I say is that we have to 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 put any possibility in, in a hierarchy of uh, of probability. So is it possible that we have like an alien invasion? Yes. Is it is it possible that we have quantum computers uh, uh, or uh, artificial intelligence revolution uh, against the human being like Terminator? Yeah, there are a lot of things that are possible, but you have to create, a, 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 you have to gauge, you have to create a, a scale, a, a ranking of possibilities. And um, I think that uh, realistically, uh, this uh, a, a global scale uh, electronic disruption due to uh, solar phenomenons is not something that is considered very realistic right now. So I will not, uh, I will, uh, um, it will be, for example, geopolitical uh, situations uh, uh, partitioning the internet network, that's a way more um, realistic threat for me in my Bayesian estimation of the, of the future. I would expect a, an internet partition uh, in the next 10 years for geopolitical uh, causes mu much before than any uh, uh, civilization level solar storm or something like that. But that's it, I'm, I mean, I, I'm a theoretical physicist, so that means that I can theor theorize about things, but I know nothing. So I have no data about solar storm, I know nothing, so I don't know. Yeah. Now, because of that, I just wanted to clarify that once for all, you know, uh, still ask that question. Um, let me let me go back to the core. Uh, do, you, do you think that the uh, there's there's some features or elements of Bitcoin or the, you know, the existence of Bitcoin, the, it's, uh, first of all, the absolute scarcity, uh, the the difficulty adjustment, and um, the the total virtual digital existence of Bitcoin. Do you think these and, may, and maybe a few other components of of Bitcoin makes it so difficult for most people either to you know not take it seriously, not to understand it, ignore it? Um, what do you think are the features uh, or elements of Bitcoin which make it really uh, for people really hard to grasp or not just not get in touch with it um, yeah i think you mentioned some of the most i mean uh, the things you mentioned are, are just uh, can just sound like a normal um, economical uh, buzzwords but they are truly incredible i mean uh, total scarcity uh, absolute scarcity uh, absolute inelasticity of supply these are something that nothing before ever had in human or natural history. So everything we, we used as a resource had some kind of scarcity, but the more supply, the, the, the more demand there was for this stuff, the more we managed to get more supply using technology. There was never a self-regulating strong resistance against uh, supply elasticity before Bitcoin. Even gold, which is the best approximation of that, is not that. Uh, so this is something very huge. I would probably maybe collapse um, absolute scarcity with uh, uh, difficulty adjustment, which also means uh, uh, time inelasticity. It's basically the same thing. Then there is a, 
uh, thought um, complete um, digital, uh, I mean, digital totality, you could call it, uh, it becomes just digital. I don't think that's, uh, some people still have some kind of problem with that, but that should not be a problem for us right now. Like 99% of uh, global money supply is only digital already. Uh, maybe some people already think, still think that there is some kind of gold uh, backing of, of money, but there is not. Uh, money is basically all digital already before Bitcoin. The problem is that it is centralized digital instead of decentralized digital, so it is fragile against uh, corruption and external control by, by adversarial uh, actors, by, by bad actors. But it's already digital. And uh, our communication uh, is digital, and but I mean we exist physically, biologically. But soon we will see podcasts with entirely digital avatars of people. It's not so uh, difficult to imagine. So uh, digital, uh, complete digital nature of Bitcoin. It's strange, but it's not unprecedented. And I don't think it should be something so shocking. What can be a little bit shocking about Bitcoin and can be uh, uncomfortable for some people uh, intellectually is that Bitcoin is completely synthetic. So with that, I mean what George Sergin calls a synthetic commodity. Uh, in, during all human history, nobody was able to centrally plan uh, the, the diffusion of a, of a commodity uh, or of a collectible uh, and let alone money. So uh, the, the development was always an emergent phenomenon bottom up from, uh, from a natural thing that was adopted. So nobody arrived, like in my articles, in my series of articles, there is you, the, the, the main character, which is the second person, you, the reader, and you uh, had the idea to use gold for money. So it's like centrally planned. But that's not the way money was, was developed. Uh, there was no synthetic creation. It's, nobody said this is a commodity. Something was used already as a collectible, and then it started to be used as uh, as a medium of exchange, and then it became the collateral for some debt, and then it became money. While Bitcoin is actually a guy or a group of guy, but a central planner for a, so uh, when we talk about econo economics and uh, Austrian theory, we always speak bad of central planners like central planning is bad but what we mean is that central planning doesn't scale so we cannot have central planning of complex phenomenon but uh, and we cannot central plan other people's life but we can and we must centrally plan our own like when you are an entrepreneur you centrally plan your enterprise and you should do that so for a little while bitcoin was centrally planned by satoshi nakamoto then after he left and now is not centrally planned anymore and now it's uh, it's uh, organically growing and it's uh, independently behaving and it's uh, immutable and independent and incorruptible but at the beginning one guy created it and he created it with the feature to be idle money and he created it as money and he is taking over as money that's something which is truly unprecedented. Even a typical, I mean, I know many guys which are very, uh, so Bitcoin is like a tool to explain uh, Austrian economics to people in a way, because it's like uh, uh, Austrian economics uh, um, instantiated into, uh, into a tool. Uh, but for this particular aspect, it is a little bit the negation uh, uh, of, uh, of some, um, of some, um, uh, Austrian economics uh, rhetoric because uh, uh, any Austrian economics is about things emerging from the market. In this case, uh, yeah, Satoshi Nakamoto was the market and the first people cooperating with, with him, it was the market. But there were very few individuals centrally designing a system in order to become money and it is becoming money. And that's surprising. That was a little bit uh, uncomfortable to me as well at the beginning. It's like, uh, it's like, it sounds like irrealistic. It's impossible that you can design something that will be used as a standard. But that's actually, I mean, uh, money was never designed before. It always emerged. But, for example, uh, writing systems, some writing systems were designed by one or a few guys and they took over, like Cyrillic alphabet, uh, the, 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 Japanese, uh, the Japanese or uh, Korean alphabet. There are a lot of systems that were created by a very small group of people and then the adoption was organic and, uh, and spontaneous and impossible to plan. But the creation was, uh, was, uh, was uh, synthetic. And Bitcoin is synthetic. It's not something 
is not that Satoshi created the collectible and this collectible was used as money. Satoshi created something to become a, a digital commodity and it was created as a digital commodity. That's fascinating. Um, Giacomo, do you think, I mean, uh, it is, uh, a lot of people say that, probably you're going to say that too, that uh, whoever that was, he, she, they, Satoshi Nakamoto, uh, this, this combination, this uh, synthetic, you know, fusion of all these technologies, his, his knowledge of Austrian economics, of mon monetary properties, but my, my main question is that the time frame which it has been taking now and is going to be uh, taking you know, for years and maybe even decades to come, do you think he foresaw that, the process or the, 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 the slowliness of this process to, in order to uh, facilitate, to smoothen maybe the process for humanity to you know, adopt slowly uh, as it is growing also in price, in value, to come into this space, you know, step by step, because maybe he foresaw that most people are not going to get it. May, you know, it's going to take time. Do you think, do, do you understand my question? Like, uh, okay, yeah. it's like 10 years has been passing by, but, uh, you know, maybe it has to do with my impatience, because I always talk about mass adoption, mass adoption, just for hodling. I'm like, why don't more people start, don't, you know, it's already mainstreaming and it's, they already should get it that it's a store of value and it's exponential and hyperloops growing and growing. Do you know where I'm going with this question? Do you think he foresaw yeah. that process? So there are some clues that uh, at a certain degree he did. Like, for example, there are a few sentences. It's very, I think it's very interesting to read back uh, what Satoshi wrote in, in the forum, for example. And uh, he was not a perfect prophet. Like, he, he did make a lot of wrong predictions. One was, for example, CPU for, uh, for mining. He, he, was, he, he was not thinking about uh, CP, uh, GPU mining. It was something predictable in theory, but he didn't predict that. Uh, and uh, after a while, uh, st people started to talk about GPU mining, uh, and uh, he, Satoshi eventually got it. There are some, uh, there are some evidence of him acknowledging the, the concentration of uh, the specialization. And then when the specialization started to happen, he had this idea of uh, perfect uh, first layer scalability that was actually a wrong idea. Uh, now we can say it, uh, we can say it uh, clearly, like uh, the famous sentence, I don't have the time to, uh, if you don't believe me or you can get it, I don't have the time to convince you, sorry. That's a sentence that we love because it's very badass. I mean, that's a, that's a nice sentence. People use it on shirts. but the guy, the guy uh, that he wanted to didn't want to convince, then Larry Mer, which is the scammer of uh, EOS and uh, Steam and, uh, and, uh, and the first one, uh, EOS, so I, I don't remember the first one. Uh, yeah, BitShares. So the guy, which is a scammer, was actually right in that case. He was saying that uh, the same things that Al Fini said to Satoshi, basically on the second day of, uh, of email exchanges, he said, this system cannot scale globally on first layer because uh, this is basically global consensus. It means that everybody has to know forever uh, every transaction and store and validate transaction forever. This cannot scale. And Satoshi had this idea to use some kind of cryptographic magic in order to have very few people doing all the work, like, uh, like uh, a very um, uh, uh, trusted third party, but uh, some kind of uh, uh, cryptographic magic called uh, proud proof uh, that could actually make this uh, specialization uh, trustless. And so everybody can just use the, uh, the private keys and just verify the proof of work. And only a few nodes will have to keep track of every state change. That's not the case because uh, unfortunately, uh, the, this uh, cryptographic idea of fraud proof was not uh, possible. Uh, it is not possible that it may be theoretically impossible. And so what we said before, that if somebody tries to change Bitcoin, your single node will resist the change. That's only true if everybody runs his nodes. And if you just delegate your node to a few company, then the government just has to go to this company, take over control of the company, and they can control Bitcoin completely, which is luckily not the case because the, the security model of Bitcoin that Satoshi designed is not relying on this uh, um, hypothesis of Satoshi. But Satoshi was wrong about that. And these two mistakes are also uh, correlated because at the beginning, he was thinking about a system where the proof of work is really decentralized. And it was wrong.
because proof of work with the specialization of PGA and ASICs, it became very centralized. Then when he understood that proof of work was very centralized, he said, okay, let's centralize node operation and people will just verify with SPV fraud proofs, which doesn't exist. Uh, so uh, he was first thinking about full decentralization of proof of work and then thinking about uh, centralization of proof of work and node validation, but uh, with some kind of trick in order to maintain total trustlessness. And it was wrong on, on, on both accounts. But uh, I think that about your question, so the rate of adoption, I think that about that Satoshi was actually kind of right. One of the typical example is when people was trying to push Wikileaks. So Wikileaks started to have problems with uh, credit card uh, donation very early on. I think it was, I don't remember, probably 2011 already. And somebody was saying, we should reach out to Wikileaks and telling them if that even if they cannot accept credit card donation anymore because the U.S. government is, uh, is threatening the, the, the credit card companies uh, and PayPal and they are forcing companies to stop providing donation services. Uh, and uh, people were saying, we should reach out so they accept Bitcoin. Uh, and Satoshi said, don't, uh, we are not ready. This is a, pre uh, this is a pet project. The, the economic value is very small, it can be attacked. The hash rate is very small, it can be attached. The software is not uh, thoroughly reviewed, so it's still fragile. There is a lot of things that, that are missing. We are too small. If we try to kick that, that, uh, that, ne that uh, um, uh, wasp uh, nest right now, we will, uh, the system will, will not survive. So he knew that uh, you cannot stress the anti-fragility of your system. It's like, uh, if you have a, a baby, if you have a child, uh, you have to let him face the, hard, uh, the hardship of, of life in order to become stronger, but not too soon because if he, start, uh, if he dies too young, because of that, he cannot uh, become more strong. So uh, uh, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger, but first, it doesn't have to kill you. So uh, in that case, Satoshi was very aware of the uh, very slow uh, time frame necessary for uh, adoption and not just adoption but also um, uh, uh, let's say uh, review and uh, hardening and uh, strength uh, uh, I mean uh, building of Bitcoin in general. Great, great. Um, so Giacomo, um, I have a, because I had an, uh, a situation today where I should have maybe paid more attention, just maybe, you know, but sometimes it's good because I, I ask those, you know, naive questions for the newbies also, which is good. I tried to pay a ticket for the Lightning Conference in Berlin, which I hope we're going to, you're going to be there. Uh, uh, via, I'll be there. Yeah, yeah. Be beautiful. Via BTC PSO with my, uh, first I tried with my uh, uh, Blockstream green wallet. <laughs> and then, and then the second time with my samurai wallet, and um, you know it's good because uh, I asked them the question. Okay, I get it. It's not a lightning wallet, but do you think it's realistically possible, or do you think it is potentially possible in the very near future to have both functions? Why can't I just transfer, you know, some satoshis from my uh, Bitcoin wallet uh, to a lightning? wallet i mean it would that is that something realistic that you know to to have a feature a function like a you know a push of a button like okay i'm i'm you know i just want to send to a lightning wallet well, what's the problem with that why do we need a lightning wallet for that well so the other way around is working so a wallet that were created for lightning they also are uh, normal on chain wallet so the other way the other way around is true if you have a lightning wallet a good lightning wallet that's also an on-chain Bitcoin wallet. Maybe since, the, I mean, since uh, everything takes time and energy, so nobody can do everything. So the, the, the Lightning teams, maybe they're focused on the Lightning experience. So maybe the on-chain um, behavior of your Lightning wallet, for example, if you use Eclair uh, or, uh, or Breeze, or uh, you can pay on-chain, of course, with Eclair or Breeze. Uh, and also you can pay via Lightning. Maybe the on-chain part of, of, of uh, Eclair is not as, uh, uh, as, um, uh, uh, as uh, uh, good as uh, Green or Samurai or other because they are focusing on Lightning instead. But there is an on-chain functionality. It's not the other way around because uh, a wallet that has been built way before 
uh, to be good on chain wallet, now they have to change the logic completely in order to become a lightning wallet. And it's not really the same kind of job. Like they are very distinct. So people working, I know very well people working for green. They, they are very security oriented. They do things that are very safe, consistent, um, safety first, conservative. Uh, you don't play around with random stuff. This stuff should be maintainable, sustainable, uh, clear incentives should be for the user should be to do what is right. While the lightning development is something different because, uh, you know, the first app is for actual money. So you are moving money. It's still, okay, Bitcoin is an experiment, but it's a very huge experiment right now. So you shouldn't mess up. The second layer is something where you can mess up because the amounts are very small. The technology is very new. It is a second layer, so if you mess up completely, you can still burn it to the ground and build it again. So right now, if we, if we mess up with Bitcoin and the first layer is destroyed, we probably lo we have lost our opportunity for centuries maybe to do something like that. While if we, burn, if we completely mess up with Lightning, that's a pity for, uh, for your channel because we had to close and to reopen. Maybe there's, there's some dis disruption. Maybe some service provider will have to update the infrastructure. That's, that's a pity, but it's not a problem. We burn down lightning to the ground and we build it again on top of Bitcoin. We didn't destroy the monetary policy. We didn't destroy, destroy the, uh, the, the fundamental security of cold storage, uh, huge wealth uh, uh, store, storage. So uh, Bitcoin layer one is all about safety uh, and also about like fee estimation. A good Bitcoin layer one wallet has to be a very good fee estimation to minimize your fee then maybe replace the fee in order to bump your fee if it's not enough. Then you have to have a very good coin selection. Like you don't want to select the bigger UTXOs, otherwise you remain with dust and you cannot auto spend it. But if you spend all the dust, then uh, it's, uh, I mean, you spend more now. So you have to, to decide the trade-off between now and the future. And then you have to balance privacy against uh, uh, price. So maybe if you aggregate more UTXO, you spend more. Uh, but uh, you also have less privacy. So there is a lot of consideration for a good on-chain wallet. And also there, you have a lot of money there maybe, so you want uh, a multi-sig with the green or with Electrum, you want, to, or you want it to be very safe. All, the Lightning team, they have a completely uh, different kind of uh, uh, priority right now. They have to be fast, they have to build on protocols that are not yet very, there was a very bad bug on Lightning just uh, discovered just a few weeks ago and fixed. Uh, nothing like that could happen right now, it uh, should happen on the first layer because the first layer is, is sacred, it's, it's, it's holy. You cannot mess up with it. The second layer you can. So the difference, you can, you can feel it. So maybe in a Claire, if you use a Claire or Breeze, you can pay uh, for the Lightning uh, conference ticket and you can also use it as a Bitcoin wallet, but the, bit, the on chain experience may be less uh, accurate if you use green the other way around. Of course, most uh, Bitcoin, the, the more the Lightning becomes established, Lightning is still very young. So it's still developing, it's still an experiment, it's still reckless. The more Lightning becomes really a beta, uh, the more it becomes consolidated and safe. Uh, and uh, the, the specification become uh, fixed, uh, then the normal uh, first layer wallets will start to adopt it. Electrum is the first uh, major uh, first layer um, wallet, which is also adopting Lightning with their own implementation. Uh, Green will probably do something in between, but they are working on that, of course. They are not just ignoring Lightning. They're just, uh, it's not a priority. Let's consider that Lightning may change uh, uh, Bitcoin on chain will not change in a, in a very strong way anymore. I mean, there will be some major changes like Schnorr signatures and eventually uh, um, uh, cross input aggregation and then uh, taproot with MAST. Uh, th th there will be some changes, but it will be slow, uh, gradual changes. Lightning will change incredibly because you will have uh, atomic multipath. You may have the, the other way around of the generation of the pre-image. You may have the replacement of the uh, HTLC, which, uh, which uh, ACDSA signatures. You can have, uh, or you can have major changes like L2, which changes the, the dynamic completely. So Lightning is a living experiment. We, we call it beta 
but the, the level of the network right now is closer to an alpha. You can use it for small change. You can use it for small amounts, but you should not put uh, big amounts of lighting. It can still change dramatically. You cannot invest a lot of time of your company to a lighting implementation if you are not uh, ready to do that again, maybe in two years. So it's natural that uh, that uh, that established wallet they go slowly and steadily about the adoption, while the uh, newborn uh, newborn lightning startups they can be more reckless and more, uh, uh, of course, at uh, at equilibrium when Bitcoin, when the uh, LNP BP stack of the protocol. So that when the, uh, the you know in the internet we have TCP/IP. IP is a layer of everybody sending packets to everybody and it's not scalable per se and it's very old like it's from the, the 70s, the first experiments. And then there is TCP, which is a layer on top where you create a single connection. This second layer uh, took, uh, took more time to be, to be developed and, uh, and, and then you have layers on top, you have uh, uh, HTTP, you have a lot of layerization. With Bitcoin will be the same. And eventually when LNP BP, so the Lightning Network Protocol, Bitcoin Protocol, will become the standard, what I imagine in 10 years from now is one wallet which uh, when, send, when I have to pay you, you send me an invoice. First, I will try to pay you on Lightning directly if there is a channel. If there isn't a channel, I will try to find a route to you. If there isn't a route, I will try to open a channel with you all automatically. And even when I open a, a, a channel, uh, I will uh, coin join with other wallets, uh, with, uh, with Snor um, cross input aggregation, uh, mixing the output. So our wallet will, will start to do a lot of crazy things automatically eventually. But right now it's very early on. So you have uh, uh, teams specializing in some things. So um, you have the Claire guys working on a very good wallet, the Breeze guys, the same. And then you have green, which is uh, focused on, on what green does. Yeah. Um, so uh, great. That, that's, that's, that's amazing, the, the knowledge. Um, so um, let me ask you something else. Uh, so uh, first of all, uh, do you really think it's going to take 10 years? Or do, do, you, do you find it realistic that it's going to be happening the next few, you know, exponential curve I mean, in technology, technological, whatever uh, development? So, uh, I use the, uh, I try to use an estimation that, uh, I mean, before 10 years, so I was comfortable to not be uh, okay. conservative to be yeah. by reality. So it could happen uh, sooner. Of course, uh, uh, it will take some years. Uh, technology can be exponential, but uh, uh, security related technology cannot really go too fast because you have to uh, study, experiment, test. So even the second layer will have to to go with some kind of response. You cannot be completely reckless. So it will take some time. Also, the, th the thing is that there is not, we discussed it before about store of value and minimum of exchange. There is no rush at the point. Uh, we, uh, I mean, people in the dark market or people doing international payment uh, across uh, forbidden, forbidden routes, they need Bitcoin now and they can use Bitcoin now because, okay, if you really want to move uh, uh, a few hundred thousand dollars out of Venezuela or out of China, you pay your your them uh, $4, $5, $10 fees, pay it and wait for one hour, two hours, three hours confirmation, just wait. If you have to really use that in the black market, you use it in the black market, you wait and you pay, there is no real problem. If you want to, to use it to, 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 buy, to pay for tickets for a conference, you do that because it's cool, because it's like uh, we want to try, but you don't really need that. Uh, we, we are very privileged, so uh, you, we could have paid the conference with credit card or PayPal. Uh, there is really no need. So first, there will be the establishment of Bitcoin as a store of value, which will take more and more of the global distribution of wealth. Then people will start to, to use it as a medium of exchange in particular markets, which really needs it, like gray, gray markets mostly. And then, Finally, uh, out of uh, pure uh, standardness, pre standardness pressure, we will use Bitcoin also for normal things that we don't specifically need Bitcoin for. So we will pay Bitcoin, we will pay coffee with Bitcoin, pay for coffee with Bitcoin as a last step, not, not as the first step. So uh, maybe 
uh, it, so the technological, the technical infrastructure will be ready before 10 years, but I don't think that you will have to pay for it. No, of course, this is the lighting conference, so it makes sense. But when you go to another conference or a concert, you will probably not pay with Satoshis for a while. Uh, and even if you pay with Satoshis, maybe you will use not a decentralized solution like Lightning, but a centralized a provisional solution for a while because it makes sense because you don't really need yet a completely decentralized payment layer great okay i have a, a couple of other questions but i'm going to save that uh Giacomo. uh thank you so much for your time it's uh more than one hour because people need to digest all this amazing information and knowledge uh because i have some question about coin joining and you know uh about some uh the the terminology that you termed in your articles darkness uh, I just wanted to go, but we can do that some next time, you know, if you, uh, if you, you know, whenever you're willing well, to. If you don't, I am um, just, if you want, just two minutes. Yeah, for please, please question. go ahead. Thank you. So the, uh, the, the reason I, I wanted to use this strange termino terminology is that uh, the, the terminology about the features uh, of money is very, very uh, inconsistent and a little bit redundant. So we have like portability and storability and durability and divisibility. And, and uh, in the Bitcoin standard book, Saifedian and Moose, uh, he used the, the term hard, hard money, hardness, which was very clear. And I found it, I found it so refreshing that people was not trying to make sense of different uh, uh, legacy terminological, uh, it's a very messy, the situation is not, it's, the, the, the features of money are not orthogonal. They are a lot, uh, there is a lot of redundancy. So he clarified the hardness concept very well. And I've seen that people was actually uh, getting very well the concept of hard money, hardness. Even if there are uh, synonyms like uh, sound money or uh, durable or stuff like that, but hard was very good. So I, I, I understood that, that we have not the same kind of very easy, direct, uh, simple, terminology for uh, uh, what we see what we say usually with uh, privacy fungibility deniability confidentiality or these terms that are not exactly the same like fungibility is about uh, the object while uh, deniability is more about the person uh, but still they, they, they cover the same kind of problem which is how to keep uh, your privacy in a way uh, and privacy is a broader concept so i created that i created i adopted darkness as uh, i adopted darkness this sounds like batman <laughs> i adopted darkness uh, as the second term and then the, i i realized that there, there is like a triangle of uh, trade-offs uh, basically you can have hard money and dark money usually is not very scalable so i use it scaleness as the third uh, third uh, inexistent word because i couldn't use scalab i could use scalability but scalability is a very technical a word which means something else which is now in bitcoin when you say scalability you actually mean divisibility on the first layer uh, which is not exactly what scalability is so i use the scaleness and i create this triangle which is interesting because uh, for example um, confidential transaction they are great for darkness but they are very bad for uh, scaleness because uh, transactions are heavier and slower and they are very bad for a little bit bad for hardness because you can have inflation bug and stuff like that. So you can actually move your uh, your uh, your point uh, your pointer in this trade off. And fiat money typically is uh, a, the, let's say fiduciary um, information money uh, became very very good in scaleness and very very bad in darkness and hardness. So I decided to use this stream. Of course, you can still think about the classical property of money, but I think that these three nicely uh, represent uh, like the trade-off uh, uh, circle that you, or triangle that you can have. And uh, in order, since I am a, feti uh, I'm a symmetric, symmetry fetishist, I decided to also concentrate uh, the technological features of Bitcoin to three things as well, which I choose to be like the controller supply for, the, for hardness, the coin join structure for uh, darkness, uh, which eventually will also include the uh, Schnorr aggregation and stuff like that. And I also use that chapter to introduce uh, the UTXO model and uh, the, um, uh, the off-chain paradigm uh, for uh, off-chain transactions. So uh, yeah, I, uh, in the articles, I, I use uh, these two triplets, which are not very typical. And uh, maybe somebody will be uncomfortable with the terminology, but I think it's useful for uh, also very mnemonic, I think. 
Thank you so much for the enlightenment. That was beautiful. Okay, uh, Giacomo, that's about it. Um, thank you so much for your time and for you know sharing your knowledge. I hope looking forward to see you at the Lightning Network conference and you know learning more from you and all the other speakers. And uh, yeah, uh, talk to you soon and hope we can repeat this again with a one-to-one -one or a panel discussion. Absolutely. Thank you so much. See you soon. Bye. Bye, Giacomo. Ciao. Thank you.